again. Good morning, everyone. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Join me in God's Word in Acts chapter 15. We are going to see today one of the most important decisions or judgments made for the church and the ramifications that it holds even up until today. This is a very important chapter within the context of the book of Acts, and I cannot wait to go through this chapter with you in Acts chapter 15. As you're making your way there, I also want to just draw our hearts in prayer to the Lord. Would you please join me in prayer as we seek the Lord together? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sit in front of your scripture. We thank you, Lord, that it is living and breathing and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It can pierce the deepest parts of us, Lord, and we need that kind of piercing, Father. We need to have lives that rightly reflect your character. And so, Lord, there are things that we need to change and step away from, and there is a, a life and, and a person, your son Jesus, to follow. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would guide us, lead us, correct us, and to use this time, Lord, to uh, show us your truth. Lord, we ask your blessing on this time. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, for you are my rock and my redeemer. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. On December 16th, 1944... The Allied powers did not expect what Adolf Hitler would unleash. It was a season of World War II where it looked like everything was in the Allied powers' favor. Attack was happening on a Western front as well as an Eastern front. With an impending threat of Russian military forces to come in from the East and in the minds of most of his war advisors and counsel, Hitler was being encouraged to write a treaty with the Allied powers in the West, which would include France, Belgium, England, and the United States. Adolf Hitler would not listen to his advisors, and he did on that day what no one expected. We know this battle that would ensue, it's called the Battle of the Bulge. And the reason why isn't because they sent their most rotund military commanders to the front lines. The reason it's called the Battle of the Bulge is because Hitler believed that if they could divide the Allied powers and their resources, that it would force them into a treaty that would, be, that would result in Germany's favor. And then with a treaty on the West, they could concentrate all of their firepower on the East. And so they picked an area of, they believed, that was the most vulnerable. And it was a forested area in Belgium called the Ardennes. And that was an area occupied by American forces. And those American forces were primarily trainees. They were not the most experienced soldiers, but there were some battle-hardened troops amongst them. And so the Axis powers sought to drive a wedge into the Allied front line to create a bulge which would split resources and would overwhelm the American forces. It was a latch-ditch effort that didn't work. Because what they did not know was that would end up becoming one of American military's finest hours, where they held the line and the ground was stood. It took six weeks, but at the end of six weeks, that conflict broke the back of the Axis powers and their agenda. And it's really what led to uh, the end of the war. He was a devious schemer. And his agenda was to divide the resources and the mindset of those set against him. Do you know we face in every generation the same kind of threat spiritually? Because we have a tenacious enemy 
who listens to no one but himself, to in every generation to try to divide the people of God on the most central truth there could ever be, and it is the message of salvation. Every generation, salvation and the doctrinal truths around it come under attack because our enemy is relentless, and this creates a problem. The problem for the church in every generation is we face divide over core doctrines, and that divide threatens the church in every generation. John MacArthur, in his New Testament commentary, he wrote this, At various times in its history, the church's leaders have met together to settle doctrinal issues. For example, historians recognize seven ecumenical councils in the first seven centuries of the church's existence. Of those seven, perhaps the two most significant were the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon. At those councils, erroneous teaching about the person and nature of our Lord was condemned, and the biblical position carefully defined. As important as those councils were, the Jerusalem council described in this chapter, Acts 15, was the first and most significant of all, for it fixed the most momentous doctrinal question of all. What must a person do to be saved? The issue before us that is on trial, church, is the answer to the question, what must someone do to be saved? I want to prepare you that this is going to be more along the tone of the passage, that we would stand firm and that we would hold the line of that which comes under attack in every generation starting in the first century. We're going to go through this text in three sections. The issue of, of salvation is raised. So the issue is raised in the first five verses. A judgment is made when different leaders of the church speak and give testimony and witness. And then there's an outcome that is shared that will go out to the church at large. Issue raised, judgment made, outcome shared. We're going to walk through the text and I'll make some comment as we go, and then we'll drive to our conclusion as we talk about the most central aspect of what it means to be Protestant in our faith. Let's read the scriptures together. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1. We'll go through 1 through 5. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem... They were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So we have Paul and Barnabas who have just ended this incredible first missionary journey. It almost came at the cost of their very lives, but God saw them safely through it. They returned to Antioch in Syria, which was the church who had commissioned them to go and present the good news of Jesus amongst the Gentile people as well as the Jews in the Roman Empire. They went and did that, and they came back, and everyone is full of joy except a group known as Judaizers. Judaizers would have been people who had faith in Jesus Christ but had the fervent belief that in order to have genuine salvation through Christ, you still had to have the sign of circumcision through the covenant God made with Abraham and follow the law of Moses. Judaizers believed to be truly saved, you would have faith in the Jewish Messiah 
as you held to the Jewish way of life. And they introduced that. And the passage says there was no small dissension. That means things got really ugly. They were combative with one another. Each side staunchly holding their ground about what side of the issue they were on. Was salvation going to be by faith alone and Christ alone? Without any imposition of Jewish tradition or culture on the Gentiles? Or would the Judaizers have the truth, faith in the Messiah and adherence to the Mosaic law and the Old Testament covenants? That was the issue at hand. The chapter begins in chapter 1 with this issue, or chapter in verse, or verse 1, verse 2, and then in verse 5, it's raised again. And so the people appeal to Paul and Barnabas, please go to Jerusalem. Please go to the epicenter of this movement that, is, that has changed our lives and talk with the elders there and the apostles. They wanted a ruling they wanted a judgment made on this. And so that's where the text takes us in verse 6. Follow along as I read the heart of our passage, verses 6 through 21. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And there had been much debate. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore... Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, Aramaic form of Peter's name, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So the issue has been brought forward. Paul and Barnabas are there along with a group in Jerusalem. Now notice, this group of believers, they are labeled as what kind of Jewish leader? They're called Pharisees. This is amazing. This means the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ has penetrated their hearts. But they are under the delusion that salvation is through faith in a Messiah alongside human good work. My friends, this has been the deception from the very beginning. There, all, there has not been anything new under the sun, nor will there ever be anything new under the sun when it comes to the battleground of what does someone do to be saved. It is either faith in Christ and Christ alone, or it is faith in Christ plus good human effort. What we have modeled for us is we have Peter, and 
Very interestingly, this is, this is his swan song in the book of Acts. This is it. This is Peter's mic drop. And it really was a mic drop because once he was done, it said no one said a word. He appeals to what God had done. He appeals to the fact that it was God who sent him. God who gave him the vision that the gospel message could be for the Gentiles. God who was the one who poured out the Holy Spirit on them as the primary central sign that genuine spiritual life has come. They received the Holy Spirit just as the Jewish people had received the Holy Spirit, just as the Samaritans had received the Holy Spirit. Now even the Gentiles could receive the Holy Spirit. Peter appeals to the work of God as his platform of defense. And then he does the mic drop. Were they not saved just as we have been saved? Boom! Then Paul and Barnabas talk about the accompanying signs and wonders. And this detail was very important for the Jewish people because they believed that when God ushered in something new, he would accompany the new revelation with signs to to validate that, oh, this is from God. That's how prophets worked in the Old Testament. They would give signs or they would do wonders and that would give validation to the people. God has done something new. Peter appealed to God's character and God's work. Paul and Barnabas appealed to the signs and the wonders that gave validity to what they witnessed, that what Peter has declared has been validated by signs and wonders. This is a very Jewish approach to understand this is the truth from God. Finally, a leader in Jerusalem named James. This is not James, the brother of John, because he What had already happened to that, James? He had already lost his life for his faith. He was the first apostle to die. Stephen, the first martyr. James, the brother of John, was the first apostle to die for his faith. This James, this James is the brother of Christ himself. He is now, through faith in his brother, become the, the ruling elder, the lead elder in the city of Jerusalem. And so he comes to now speak from a platform of authority what he declares as truth. And this is where he says, God's word has prophesied this. Therefore, what has been said is true. So you have Peter declaring the character and the work of God You have Paul and Barnabas declaring the accompanying, validating signs and wonders of God. And then you have James saying, we stand in the fulfillment of the word of God. Brothers, this is true. If our problem is that divide comes when essential core doctrines are disagreed upon, then we can look at this and take heart that there is a process God has given biblically that we should appeal to the character and the work of God. We should appeal to His work amongst us, but then we need to make our decisions on what is declared and revealed, which is, this is our source of authority, church. It is not what I think. My brain can be a bag of cats. That can be a weird, strange place sometimes. You do not want to rely on human counsel. That's why we appeal to the authority of the Scriptures. And every generation must be humbled to the declaration of what God says in His Word. Now, James says that this is true, but then there's also a consideration made for the Gentiles, as well as their interaction with their Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, I want to draw your attention back again to the text. He says in verse 19, chapter 15, this says, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. 
This means that they're not going to require circumcision, and they're not going to require that they adhere to the law of Moses. That salvation is in the Messiah and the Messiah, Jesus Christ, alone. But there are behaviors that the Jewish brothers are going to encourage the Gentile brothers in, particularly in deference to the Jewish believers. First of all, for all of them, he says, they should abstain from the things polluted by idols. Now, Peter declared that all food was clean to eat. But if there was food that was dedicated to a Greek god or a Roman god, they would say, don't confuse the matter by eating food that has been dedicated to idols. Do you want this Chick-fil-A? I dedicated it to Jupiter. Would you like it? Say, no, thank you. That's God's chicken. Okay? That's the Lord's chicken. So, but that was a common practice. And that was going to be a challenge for the Gentile believers. I can remember in Uganda going through the villages sharing the gospel. We interacted with this one believer who's trying to stand firm for his faith. And I said, how can we pray for you? And he said, the man who owns all of our fields His loved one died, and he expects all of us to bring a sacrifice to his idol at the funeral. These Gentile believers, when they would be hosted in someone else's home, it was a common occurrence where they would have to refrain from eating food that had been set aside and dedicated for pagan worship. The Jewish leadership says, abstain from that, stand your ground, hold the line. Then they say, remain pure from sexual morality. It was a common practice that in these different temples throughout the Roman Empire, that to express worship was to engage in temple prostitution. Those who had come to faith in Christ may have had an entire uh, adulthood of engaging in those practices, and there would be temptations to go back and to return. And they said, don't do it. Hold the line. Stand your ground. Walk in purity. Then they say, refrain from different kinds of food that have been strangled and from blood. There's this curious verse, verse 21. It says, for from ancient generations, Moses had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read in every Sabbath in the synagogues. What James is trying to communicate to the Gentile brothers is he's saying, look it there's going to be Jewish brothers and sisters around. Please conduct yourself around them in a manner that would not make them stumble. Moses has read in every town where there's a synagogue. There are things that they have chosen to do that is right for them by following dietary restrictions, so please keep that in mind. Are you guys with me? So it was a, it was a word of clarification and also an admonishment. And so this is what happens. And for sake of time, I'm just going to describe it. That from verses 22 to 35, a contingent is sent. They pick a man named Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. We're going to see Silas travel with Paul soon. And they are the ones who go and deliver this message back to Antioch and then to the other Gentiles as the word was out. Verse 30 says, so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, having gathered the congregation together, and they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others as well. This all boils down, this whole issue, judgment, and outcome boils down to one principle, and here it is. Believers are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Can you say that with me, church? This is one of the most important creeds. Believers are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You're going to hear baptism testimony. We're going to talk about the work of Jesus in communion in just a moment. But this is what is at stake. The solution for us, and I'm going to bring us into some Latin here for a moment, 
is that we must be rooted in the five solas, the five alones. Our passage principle from the text gives us three. So I just want to show them to you. Here are the five solas, by grace alone, sola gratia. Through faith alone, sola fide. In Christ alone, solus Christus. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And if this is three of the five, then what remains? Well, let me tell you, according to Scripture alone, for God's glory alone, sola scriptura, soli deo gloria. While Martin Luther did not capture them in these five statements, these developed over the 17th and 18th centuries, this is what the reformers gave their lives toward, to reform Catholic, Roman Catholic doctrine that had fallen squarely in the category that salvation was not simply faith in Jesus Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It was salvation through the church by faith in Jesus Christ according to taking the Eucharist and keeping the principles and the, and the practices of sustaining grace. That continues, that Roman Catholic doctrine continues to this day. And so what Martin Luther and the Reformers in his footsteps, they have now crafted what we stand upon. Five declarative statements of truth. What must someone do to be saved? They must believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. And that our salvation is by Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. We must, church, hold the line to this doctrinal truth. It comes under attack in every generation. And it will always be Jesus plus effort. It'll come in new language. It'll have a new teaching. It'll come around a personality that seems compelling. But at the end of the day, the divide will be, is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Or is it Jesus plus works? Theologian Matthew Barrett wrote this. He said, The five solas form the nucleus of the evangelical faith. They not only capture the gospel of Jesus Christ and explain how that gospel takes root in the center, but they also define where the authority of that gospel resides and to what end that gospel is preached and proclaimed. This is true because God's word declares it is true. It is true because the character of God bears out the graciousness to come and to rescue those he created. And it has been demonstrated by the most irrefutable sign, and that is that Jesus Christ lives, church. Our God is gracious and holy and just and loving and merciful. Therefore, he sent his one and only son to die for us. Jesus really died. He really was buried. He really rose to new life. And he was seen, Peter says. And the testimony of Scripture from cover to cover holds to the central truth that God redeemed the people that he created by sending his one and only Son to be our Savior through no effort of our own, but to believe in Him. So what do we do? We hold the line. We hold the line. We teach, we train, we remind. It is why we practice communion on, on fifth Sundays. Those are our family worship days where we give parents the opportunity teed up 
from the church to talk about the centrality of the gospel. What did Jesus do for us? Why do we take a cracker and juice? What is the purpose of this? And when can you take it? All of those things are in the minds of kids that are like, that looks delicious. You don't have to wait for that kind of platform to teach, train, and remind, and ground your children in this. But I'm telling you, church, this debate will not go away because Hitler died, but our enemy, he lives, and he persists. And if he can divide the church on the most central front, then he will disrupt and confuse people like he's doing today. The the Roman Catholic Church believes that there are three sources of equal revealed truth. Scripture, church tradition, and the word of the Pope. Those are the three avenues of revelation. Scripture alone. I think about uh, the Battle of the Bulge and, and that, that incredible stand. And what I was really struck by was that it was a mixed ragtag group of soldiers, some battle-hardened and tested, but the majority were trainees who hadn't seen actual combat. And yet they served alongside one another. And what would become what, according to Winston Churchill, he said, this is undoubtedly the greatest American battle of the war and will, I believe, be regarded as an ever-famous victory, which it was. And the church is comprised of people who feel very inexperienced or untested along others who have been battle-hardened. I was talking with Captain Davis, who is a believer in Jesus Christ, went to Dallas Seminary, what a good man, um, He talked about being scarred this morning. He's been tested in his faith, yet remains faithful to the Lord. And I know that there are many of you who may feel a sense of inadequacy when it comes to you do not see yourself as any kind of spiritual giant. Newsflash. There are no spiritual giants. There is a level ground at the cross. And all that there is are people saved by grace. That's not an excuse to not engage the scriptures and to be devoted to God by reading the scriptures. It's not an excuse to engage in idolatrous practices or engage headlong into sexual morality. It is not an excuse to do those things, but it is a call. It is a call to stand in in the word of God and to live according to it. Because everyone in here has a voice to hold the line. To teach and to train and remind what is true. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone.